Thanks for listening to the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. You can contact the show at twitter.com forward slash DW Groovecast and through Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. Good evening. I am warning you right now, if you touch my drum, I will stab you in the neck with a knife. Ain't a fucking. <laughs> Ain't a fucking. Mom! Lower it. I'm not gonna lower it. I have to do this now. I don't mind you playing it, but lower it. We're gonna straighten up? No, we had a problem. And uh, we tried to do everything we could. What do you mean? Well, you know what I mean. Nice! Little trouble there. You're rushing. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> Hello, folks. Welcome to another week of the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast. It was the show that almost wasn't. And I best can describe what I'm talking about with a brief story. Yesterday, I received a phone call from the Drummer's Weekly Groovecast training staff in medical uh, medical department. And uh, basically what I heard was our starting co-host was on the unable to perform list with the potential to be on the 15-day disabled list. So I ended up talking directly to our starting co-host and he said, no way, no way am I going to miss this big game, not coming off the Scott Meter interview. No way am I going to miss this. I'm not going to let this emotional letdown happen. So anything, coach, that I need to do to get in the game, I'm going to make it happen. And just like that, our faithful co-host, who would have made Horatio Alger proud with this story, went off into the back of the training room, into a little exam room with Dr. Feelgood, replete with needles and syringes he comes out he's feeling better than ever and back in the game in the starting lineup we have our co-host john chalden let's hear it for him thank you see that he's ready to go folks <laughs> <laughs> i'm fine i'm fine i'm fine let's do this yes let me go ahead and start off by saying Boy, how about that Scott meter? Man, the response has been overwhelmingly positive as it should be. And I'm still buzzing from just getting to hang out with him, let alone getting in depth with his background and his expertise. It was such a great, great, insightful interview. I, I mean, I thought it would be a success, but it, it's going to be listed as an unabashed success. Amen. I, I mean, you, you and I know some of his friends that have known him for 30 years. And some of them were saying, man, I actually learned a couple things about this guy that I didn't know. Isn't that something? Man, we're delighted. Yeah, that's uh, that kind of thing, you know, like, I was kind of surprised when he said, oh, I've never done an interview. I was like, oh, wow. And, and in some ways it was sort of, I felt a little daunting. And then as you pointed out, like, well, we got everything we do, whatever we ask, whatever he says, it's all fresh. And I was like, oh, that's true. Cool. And he's so, so not a self promoter that he's not rehashing, you know, a bunch of stuff that we've heard a thousand times. So it, it was just a, couldn't have been a better experience for us first time in and Scott being as gracious, gracious and humble as he is made it an experience I'll never forget. He made it easy for us, man. No doubt. Thank, thankfully so. Cause like it was our, our first shot at doing this as well. Yep. But it's not going to be our last, right, John? Nope. Hint, hint. We're going to have some more interviews coming up. I'll give you a hint. Our next guest, the name, Rhymes with Denny Staliuta. 
or Bob Smith. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But anyway. Stop it. Anyway, guys, look, the the response. It's like bad social media hype, Phil. Well, we're going to get to that in today's show, aren't we? We are. Yeah. But I I wanted to go ahead and, and thank our listeners because let me tell you, the response, as John said, has been off the chart. I mean, it's been incredibly gratifying to see the response, the emails, the texts, and just the overall amount of, of streams and downloads from this past show has been incredibly gratifying. And we really do appreciate it, guys. We really do. So uh, thank you for listening. And we, we love doing the show. And we sincerely try not to disappoint. So No doubt. Yeah. And don't hesitate to share that interview with more people and maybe they'll uh people will continue to hire scott and have their projects be as good as they can be yeah he he truly is a guy of deserving wider recognition no doubt yeah no questions asked so before we launch into the topic uh today guys we will get those perfunctories out of the way and you guys are using these so i'm gonna go ahead and keep saying them uh because you guys are reaching out which is great Feel free to email us at our email account, drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. As always, our Facebook account, which is busy, 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 and we love it, facebook.com forward slash drummersweeklygroovecast. And you can tweet us, twitter.com forward slash dwgroovecast. And then don't forget about our fledgling, still fledgling YouTube page. That's that's the one thing, man, we wish we could we could make that thing you know, take off a little bit more because let me tell you one thing. um, It's sort of, it really is our companion piece to the podcast because every time John and I talk about a, you know, a certain, you know, underappreciated drummer or a, you know, a certain great drum track. And in this case, also last week's show with Scott meter, I posted some uh, clips that we talked about in the show that Scott played on that he was very proud of and that he thought represented his drumming. And so always go over to our YouTube channel, just search Drummer's Weekly Groovecast in, you know, a YouTube search, and you will find the channel and find these different videos that we are referencing. And John said he's going to get right on all of his videos that he needs to post. Seven weeks ago. He's sick, guys. Give him a break. Seven weeks ago, too. (laughs) That's my story. (laughs) And he's sticking to it. So this week, uh, folks, our... Our topic for the week is a little bit of a dual topic. They go hand in hand. And I'm going to go ahead and give a good bit of credit to a friend of ours, a young lady here in town, a brass player. I'm not going to say her name because I don't want you creeps out there searching her down and stalking her. Uh, But she's a faithful listener to our show. Like uh, John and I are just so delighted that we have a lot of non-drummers that listen every week to our show. And and this is going to be another one of those topics that's a kind of casts a a wide net and uh, almost any musician can listen to it and get get something from it. But she is a young player in town, a young go-getter, and she was asking some advice about how do you get yourself established as a young musician or really even a veteran musician when you get to a new town. And then the second half of the show, which we'll kind of intersperse along with that main topic, is John and I had talked about from the very beginning about doing some kind of a show that related to self-promotion. Because everyone who's listening to this, when you get on social media, you're going to see folks who are expert self-promoters, sometimes to their detriment. And we're going to actually talk about that because there's there's nothing worse than than seeing the same thing posted over and over again when you know that uh, said person is all hat and no cattle. That's a good Southern reference there for you, John. You familiar like with that one? All hat and no cattle. Never heard it. And now you have. Did it make sense? Did you? Get uh, kind of... Not in the least. Well, all right. That just means that there's a cowboy that. You know, he calls himself cowboy because he wears a hat, but he doesn't have any cattle to drive. In other words, it's somebody that doesn't have a lot of substance. He's cowless. Cowless. Hat, hat, he got hat for days, vacuous in the cow department. That's called a country singer. Were we going to talk about Nashville today, son? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I think. <laughs> so, 
All right, guys. Uh, let's talk about getting established. Uh, virtually everyone at one time or another, uh, you're going to move to a new place. And even if you don't move to a new place, you still have to get established if you stay in the same city the rest of your life. And so we want to talk about how you get started on this, kind of what's the right way to do it, maybe what might be the wrong way to do it, and just some general overall tips. And, and we're not going to limit this just from the standpoint of like, hey, how do you meet people and get gigs? But we're going to talk about even things like, you know, be careful of you know, the places in a city where you live, you know, in other words, we're going to talk about making sure that you're not too isolated from where all your gigs are. Make sure you have a place to practice, blah, blah, blah. We're going to get into that as well. So the first thing regarding this is we're going to talk about how do you actually make contact with folks and, and what is kind of the proper way to make contact so you can, you know, meet musicians and hopefully find some like-minded folks, um, you know, that can get you some gigs. And so one of the first ways to do this, and I know that John and I have both done this a lot, is you need to do a little bit of hanging out. You got to get out there, get out there, find some jam sessions, find some places where, you know, the music that you want to play is being played. Go out there and meet some folks, glad hand some folks. Tell them you're in town. Tell them you like what they're doing and so on. Yeah. I know here in Atlanta there are a couple jams. And, you know, there's, there's a lot of room for uh, interpretation with jams. Some can be really good. Some can be a real drag. But, like, in, here in Atlanta, there's two in particular. Uh, there's a jazz jam that a guy named Joe Granston does. And... You know, he's kind of like considered a, a real uh, major player in the in the straight ahead jazz scene here in town. He runs a great jam with no attitude. The players are great. And that's such a huge part of that success of that jam. And as um, you know, try to search out environments like that. Kevin Scott has ones a little more experimental. But these are two guys that are just like really super well established in their in their circles and they're bringing regular players in and you know established players in and and but at the same time they've really established it the jam to be respectful to be encouraging to be open minded and and uh I think if you take the time to search those out you'll find some really great connections there as opposed to some of these cutting sessions you know I mean that's just nobody wins in those you're going to come out. You're not going to feel good. The people are just going to be. So really, you know, try to try to ask people and search out some good uh, jams like that, that you'd be surprised how much you can meet people that way. Yeah. And, you know, some, something that you can learn when you go to these things is naturally you're going to find people that you mesh with mm -hmm. and that you like what they're doing. Equally, you might find folks or you might find situations that's like, well, at least I came to this and now I know that this is not kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah. So, you know, you can, you can call the herd a little bit when you're doing that as well. That's a great point. Yeah. You know, if someone has a bad vibe or some attitude and all that, you might pick up on it. Well, that might be someone you want to steer clear of if that's not your thing. There's a, uh, I know when I first came here, um, there was a legendary club called Fuzzy's Place that I can still smell it. Yeah. I still smell of it probably, mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, it, it was one of these places where just every established legendary, you know, talked about musician in town played at regularly. A couple steady nights of bands of mm -hmm. the real upper echelon players and that. And, and, uh, that was a really great, place too where just musicians just congregated there every night no matter what you know and there was you always knew the players were going to be good there and i met a ton of people at that place and it really you know when i i started playing there relatively quickly too and that that was a uh, something a little bit different than a jam but but a really you know like search out some of those places that 
have you know just a, a re- regular musicians following, and you can meet a lot of people that way. Yeah, it was it was truly an industry place. Yeah, you know, it was the kind of thing that even if you finished a gig at midnight and you know didn't get out of there after tearing down till nearly one o'clock in the morning, you could still go there. Right, open late. And, yeah, and inevitably, there's going to be seven or eight people there. You know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that that was a, that was always a great. Um, and a, a real building block for me in establishing relationships outside of my initial circle. You know, John, you mentioned something about if you met someone at, you know, one of these different jam sessions or one of these different clubs that, uh, you know, was maybe a little bit of a dark character or a complainer or something like that, that kind of ties into the next thing I was going to say is when you, you know, it's very important when you meet these new folks, when you're out there kind of extending your hand to these people that, you yourself come off with a, a gracious air of professionalism, yeah. right? I mean, no nobody wants to come into a brand new relationship with somebody who's a complainer, you know, somebody True. who's all, who's got a little bit of a downer attitude. There's enough of that, like you said, already in, in every business, not just the music business, mm-hmm. but there's a little bit of that with everybody. So, you know, you want to make sure that you, you go into this thing with a, a, a very people friendly style attitude and just not be a complainer. It's very important to establish that, you know, on, on your first impression with these sure. folks. Or even on sort of the opposite end of the spectrum, you know, not being terribly cocky. Yeah. Um, sometimes we mask our insecurity with that so, or, you know, like kind of over the top happy and you know like just not very genuine like yeah people some people detect. come across like hey yeah. man it's so great to see you and it's like you don't you're not buying it you know and just be yourself man and be cool and laid back and i think i i've heard i heard something not long ago someone said like you know man when you're going out and hanging out initially don't let your agenda just pour off of you you know like Mm -hmm. just go hang out man like you know you don't have to necessarily be itching to play to show everybody your your business you know like sometimes it's best just to lay back and just kind of chill and be cool and yeah that's a good point that that a lot of times even though you're there from the standpoint of like letting people know that you're there to play or to be you know involved in the business and trying to get gigs later on you don't have to come across from the standpoint of like hi my name is you know john and i am here to play gigs right you know establish a bit of a personal connection first from the standpoint of hey man i'm just here i'm here to hang out and hear some music and blah 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 and, and a lot of times it will it'll will take care of itself from there true you know so after you get out there and you meet some folks and whatnot hopefully somewhere down the road you're going to get a call you're going to get some gigs, right? You're going to at least get a chance, get a shot. That's all we want. And then if you're prepared, you're going to, you know, you're going to go out there and do a good job. Well, one thing that a very wise person said to me one time when I was younger, um, they had called me for a, for a gig and they're like, Hey man, got this little thing over here that I'm doing. Love to have you come out and play for me. And it, didn't pay well at all you know it was like a $75 gig kind of thing and you know I kind of had the attitude a little bit from the standpoint well like you know why do I not get the call for the $400 gigs right and in a way the guy said well you know if if I call you for a $75 gig and you don't do it why what is my rationale for calling you for the $400 gig yeah that's a it's a really legitimate question. Right? You know, yeah. in other words, you know, if you're going to work with this guy, why should he just call you for the high paying gigs? You know? So yeah. I would encourage anybody who's out there and trying to get their foot in the door, take some gigs. You know, uh, all gigs are not going to be these high dollar gigs. They're just not. And, and I think that is a very valid reason uh, from the booking agent or from the, the guy who's booking the gig, their standpoint of like, hey, you know, I am going to have some higher paying gigs. But, you know, if I'm going to give you those, you know, go ahead and do my lower paying gigs as well, because mm-hmm. it should eventually pay off in the future, you know? Well, I, I can certainly say that some of my most rewarding gigs had nothing to do with the pay. And, you know, 
that goes for a musical experience or meeting someone that became a a regular partner in crime, you know, gigging or mm -hmm. just hanging out. And so, uh, and, and, you know, let's cut to the chase. Beggars can't be choosers here. Mm -hmm. You take everything you can and do what you can to gain from it. But you're not getting ahead by saying no and staying home. There's no chance of you meeting someone or having a rewarding mm -hmm. musical experience if you say no. So it's, you know, there's really the reality is if you're talking about establishing yourself, just take whatever you can and, and you know, get something out of it. Your worst case scenario is you make a little bit of money and then you learn that, hey, this is not for me. Yeah, that's true. You know, and then you just, you move forward. Don't dwell in the past, right? Mm -hmm. I think we've talked about that before on the show. And, you know, another thing is inevitably when you're out on different gigs and whatnot, you have to be aware of these different people that you're playing with. And as you play, you're going to receive some criticism from time to time, some constructive some maybe not so much, but it's important to be at least receptive of it and to be able to put it through your own personal filter to kind of figure out if it's valid or not. And, and one of the better things or one of the maybe more graphic examples that I can give of that is, again, if you're a young musician and let's say you have recently gotten out of a school of higher learning, like some kind of a college situation. A lot of times when you get into the real world of gigging, the real world of the music business, sometimes the criticism in the things that happen on gigs fly directly in the face of what you've been taught of in a college situation. In other words, a lot of times the advice or the criticism or the things that you get are 180 degree opposite of what you've been taught in school. And it's very important to kind of put that stuff through your brain, put it through your filter and figure out if this is, you know, if this is the kind of criticism that is legitimately valid. And maybe this is something that I need to carry with me and work on this stuff to be successful in the real world of performing. Or maybe this is some bad advice and I need to kind of carefully navigate those seas. Yeah. I, I, I think we can be really uh, hypersensitive to that kind of thing. And it's difficult to objectively look at it or listen to it or hear it or internalize it. But in general, um, you know, you, you look at what you're wanting to accomplish and who you want to be as a musician and, and take those things at face value with a grain of salt, whatever in between, you know, just sort of try to let it, you know, not dictate your, your world by any means. But well, you know, when you're getting established as a young player or even as an, as an older player, you always want to make sure that you're doing well for your employer or for your, your bandmates. And, you know, it comes with the territory with virtually all musicians that we're a little bit more sensitive anyway than say the average accountant, you know, that's out there doing stuff. I think that's just, that's part of our makeup. Mm -hmm. And so it, it, it can, it can be a blow to you, you know, whenever you have that kind of, of criticism that comes in or that kind of advice that either, like as we said before, flies in the face of everything you've been taught, or, or maybe it's just something that you flat out know is wrong. You know, I mean, that, that happens from time to time, you know, it when does. you're on a gig and then you kind of have to, to again, decide, well, is this something that you know, is, is worthy enough if you think it's wrong to compromise on where it doesn't compromise your entire musical belief or moral belief or whatever, right? 
So it's the kind of thing that, you know, you just have to, you have to kind of become a, a, a good judge of, you know, what's happening in real time, trying to fit, you know, so you don't compromise yourself, but yet, you know, something that will help you move along professionally as well, because you don't want to be kind of known as is this stubborn and flexible person but there is a good there's a good balance that you can achieve from all that true yeah i agree so a few other things you want to make sure whether you are uh, again an a, a, an older veteran player or a young whippersnapper out there trying to get gigs that you're organized and most importantly you need to be extremely organized and functional with your different types of communication. And let me tell you, there's a lot of them out there as everybody's well aware of now. Not only back in back in the day when I was getting started, it was just it was just vitally important that you were, you know, you had a phone and you had an answering machine. That was the lifeline. Well, today you've got you not only have your phone and answering machine, you got a cell phone with voicemail text messages, emails, social media instant messages. And if you provide any of that information to potential employers, you need to be consistently monitoring that stuff. Because let me tell you, I was just in a situation yesterday, yesterday, where a, a, a steady employer that I work with contacted me regarding a friend that I had recommended for a gig and this person had mailed my friend, this booking person had mailed the friend, emailed the friend, I should say, about a date. And it's a fairly close to the performance time date and, and he needed an answer mm -hmm. quickly. Well, this person, I called him on the phone and I'm like, hey, you remember this person that, that you've worked some for in the past that I recommended you for? They emailed you a day ago about a very soon upcoming date, and they need an answer yesterday. Get on this. And he's like, oh, man, I'm sorry. I haven't checked that email in like a week. Well, why did you give that email out to somebody? You know, why'd you give that address? So, folks, it is very, very important. And I mean, and that's, this sounds incredibly obvious, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's. Uh huh. So common, though. Yeah, if someone contacts you about a gig, even if you are booked or you just don't want to do it, get back to them and get back to them soon. Because on the flip side of that, I think everybody out there who's been doing it for a little while knows of at least one, if not several people who book gigs. They will also do a weird thing where when they know they have to get somebody for a gig, they'll use what I call the shotgun blast <laughs> approach to, to booking a gig, yeah. which is what they'll do is they'll get their contact folder out and they'll go, I need a drummer for this gig, so I'm going to call this guy, this guy, this guy, and this guy, and whoever gets back to me first gets the gig. Yeah. Now, I personally do not like that. I don't like that approach at all. In fact, I don't know any musician that likes that approach at all. But again, that kind of speaks to what we're talking about, about the timeliness of your response. True. So timely, I always timely. like that. I always like that uh, on the receiving end of that shotgun, like you'll call back. Oh, yeah, man, I'm booked. But have you tried so and so? Yeah, I already called. Have you tried? Yeah. Yeah. And you start going on. And then you got to go get in a fetal position in the corner, you know, like, man, I was like ninth on the list. I suck, uh, you know, musicians and their insecurities. Wait, you called seven people before me. Oh, my life is over. Twelfth man on the deal Just team stop. last to know. <laughs> Don't do the shotgun. Yeah. And you're wrecking people. <laughs> and, you know, when it comes to communicating, whether it be on phone or whether it's in writing, and, and I'm actually going to say maybe even more importantly in writing, please write well, communicate well to people, you know, use, use your grammar, you know, uh, it, it, it really, it, it might seem like a minor thing, especially in the days of, of one word tech, one word, or even one letter text messages like K, right? 
make make sure that you write and communicate well to these people. It might seem trivial, but anything you can do to help you jumpstart your own business, which is what this is, it's going to help. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, next thing, let's let's talk about some nuts and bolts that that might be kind of off the gig, right? Or or not necessarily directly applicable to a gig, but is every bit as important. Let's talk about a few financial concerns. Everybody's got those, right? Doesn't right. matter. Yeah. And something that really helped me out when I was a kid getting started on this is I had a very financially responsible mother that taught me a few things as far as like, hey, you know, I'm going to help you out a little bit, help you manage your money so you don't get in any trouble. And likewise, I also had a couple of, of other adult um, professional musicians and some teachers that also kind of helped me as far as like, here's a little advice to you. Don't do this. Make sure you do that. And one of the first things I'm going to tell any young musician, stay out of debt, live within your means. I mean, th th again, that sounds, that it does sound very obvious, doesn't it? But boy, you wouldn't believe how many times young musicians have to compromise their ability to do gigs because they're maintaining a barista job at a coffee shop because they've got $18,000 of credit card debt because they bought, you know, a, a hundred inch, uh, TV at 4k TV, you know what I mean? And, and lots of things that you, when you're starting out, you absolutely positively need to live within your means. If that means starving and, and eating ramen noodles for a while and having four roommates. That's what I had to do. But I'll tell you, it certainly paid off in the long run. Mm -hmm. So you've got to be really super careful when it comes to this stuff. Live within your means. At the beginning, you don't necessarily need a Craviato $8,000 drum kit, you know? Live within your means, get yourself on your feet and established with some of the advice we've given you so far, and eventually somewhere down the road, you will come out of your living in squalor, <laughs> so to speak, you know, and John, I'm sure you did the same thing too, right? I've eaten ramen noodles. Yeah. Shoot, I had them last week. You kidding? It's tough out here, man. <laughs> the struggle is real. <laughs> The struggle is real because you and I both know uh, some folks that got started off on the wrong foot. The business is hard enough yep. just getting started in. And then you don't need, you know, having to meet some kind of, of monthly nut. You need to be you need to be concerned with with taking gigs and making, you know, nice connections within, you know, within the industry and not have to worry about, oh, my gosh, I've got you know, a $700 credit card bill with 19% interest coming up or, 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 you know, you went out and you bought, you know, a $65,000 car, you know, you just have to be careful when you're yeah. doing this kind of stuff. Yeah. That's great advice. Um, I'll tell you, this is a, this is a, an interesting subject in that we have had quite a few friends of ours in recent years make a, a, a major move. And I'm not just talking young, mm -hmm. you know, up and comers, like seriously established, you know, just really uh, guys with great track records and, and have done big gigs and all that moving. And uh, there's, there's a lot of things to consider in this that I think sometimes in the romance of moving somewhere and, you know, like the big dreams and all that, that 
we lose sight of. Um, and I, I was thinking about this. I can talk some from experience mm -hmm. and I can talk some from just some of the common sense of it and some from other people, you know, relaying things. But um, if you're going to move to a new town, I think one thing that has to really be focused on is taking your time, knowing the place you're going and really having some well thought out plans like, uh, for example, where you're going to live. Mm -hmm. It's my opinion that, especially as a younger player, it's almost always better to live closer to city center, you know, somewhere close to town where you can get out. If you're getting out and wanting to get established or networking and hitting jams and hitting gigs and seeing bands, mm -hmm. you know, living 45 minutes out of town can really be a detriment. You know, if you're, I, I've, I personally have, you know, experienced the, at 8.30, I had every intention of going downtown to see right. someone. And by 9.30, I'm sitting on the couch watching a baseball game, you know, like, ah, yeah, I don't feel like doing that. You know, th that's, that's one example, but you know, also, you know, if you're going to have a few drinks, whatever it may be, you know, just limiting, potential problems. There's all kinds of things to consider, but most importantly being in the middle of these, uh, you know, the, the scene and being accessible to it is a huge part of, of what I think is a, a, a big step in establishing yourself. Totally um, agree. You man. know, you have to be really aware of traffic. If you're going to be a working musician, you know, living near a major, interstate that is constantly backing up well that may be a problem you know research some areas that are maybe easier to get into the city center and mm -hmm. easier to get into the areas where you know you're going to be working a lot more and you're not dealing with just shut down traffic which in major cities is inevitable yeah. So really having a good handle on that. And these are things you can ask people that live there about. You can do your research. It's all readily available information. Um, it's funny. It seems like a lot of times it, it, there are little, we'll call them artist communities, but mm -hmm. it seems like there's a lot of times that uh, in, in most cities, you will find that a lot of musicians live in kind of one area. Yeah, that's true. You know, so that's that's a good place to start definitely and uh you know again you still have to research that because i know like in atlanta there's neighborhoods where a lot of musicians live where a few blocks are relatively cool and safe and the next block is a nightmare you know like you have to, don't you know don't don't uh, so don't make the mistake of like oh that rent's so cheap well maybe it's cheap for a reason you know you've got to do due diligence and do your homework and and make sure uh, these things are are you know thought about because look you're talking about coming home at one in the morning mm -hmm. you know you're vulnerable and these are things that you have to consider you know. Um, another thing that kind of tied into that, you're load in and you're load out, you know, Hey, maybe you can live with a friend, that, but he lives in an apartment on the third floor. Walk well, up. Yeah. You know, then it becomes less attractive. You know, all of these things in your move, preceding your move, you, you really need to have thought out, thought about, um, and you know, for drummers, especially a practice space, you know. That's something that is always a challenge, you know, if you, especially if you're moving into a new mm -hmm. city and it's, maybe it's just apartment living or, you know, really trying to find out, are there practice facilities? Is there equipment provided? What's the yeah. cost? You know, all these things. Like, this research will really help you from kind of shooting yourself in the foot a lot. And I encourage you to do that if you're going to, uh, to kind of, you know, come into a city blind for lack of better terms, have, have some, some of this stuff already worked out and it'll make your life a lot easier. Yeah. And I'll give 
I'll give the Phil hot tip of the day when mm-hmm. it comes to looking for housing for drummers in particular. Or, or we, we could almost say any musician who has to load a lot of gear, whether it be PA gear or just personal backline type gear. One of the things that is extremely appealing to me is a house or some kind of a living situation that has a drive-in garage next to a room, like a storage room, maybe even a practice room, right? If you have that drive under garage, it's very easy to back your car or vehicle into it and load directly out of the storage room or the practice room that's next to it. That is a major benefit as opposed to, like you said before, having to carry something down a few flights of stairs or, you know, maybe have to carry it through a house or through an an apartment to go out to you know, another side door. If you can have, you know, the gear close by to the load in area, that is, I can't tell you the benefits you will huge reap on that, especially when it's pouring rain or snowing. Oh, there's, it, it, it just tempts you in a long night. You're dead tired. It's pouring rain. It, it, you're just, you're tempted to leave things in your car. Yeah. No, don't, don't put yourself in that position. <laughs> Yeah. You know, it's it's just you're just tempting fate every time you leave something in your car. That's not a good idea. Yeah. What well, one other thing I I want to add to this whole thing that it's a little bit of a a combination of a financial consideration and even a social consideration. And uh I've seen this sideline a few folks from making moves and and just doing the things that they needed to do to jumpstart their professional music career is I feel like that prior to getting into any type of serious long-term relationship with someone, you need to completely and totally decide on your career path. This is what I want to do. And if it involves moving to another city, get that done and take care of that and get yourself established where you want to be prior to being in a long-term relationship. It not only helps you, but it helps the other person that you could potentially get in that relationship with. Sage advice, Romeo. Yeah, well, you know, I have my moments. I'm impressed. (laughs) Well, talking about impressed, do we want to impress people with our knowledge on some self-promotion tactics? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I want to tell them what not to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, that that's that's the way that we're going to kind of approach this anyway. Okay. Is is that now that we've kind of given you some some advice on when you're going to move to a new city or if you're just trying to establish yourself as a young musician in any city, it, it you know, you've made a few contacts and you've done these things that that you need to do, but sometimes it doesn't hurt to actually put a few things out on social media, right? And I mean, we do it for this show. You know, we, it, you know, if you've got a product, whether that product is, hey, I'm a drummer or hey, this is a podcast. If people, if they don't know that it exists, then how are they going to find it, right? Right. And so, you know, there's a good bit of trial and error on all this stuff. And so, you know, we'll we'll share with you what we know and what we like and what we don't like. And the first thing that that I'll say is if you're going to if you're going to promote yourself, you better make sure that you have some substance and content to what you're promoting. Because it does not take long for folks to figure out, mm, here we go again, all hat no cattle, right? Country singer. <laughs> we were talking about Nashville, kind of in veiled breaths, right? Sort of. Yeah. So, yeah, but but really what we're saying is, is, you know, if you're going to extol the virtues of anything, make sure that there are actually some virtues there. Yeah, I like that, man. There's a, this hype and, you know, self-promotion thing is, really gotten out of control we obviously know why because it's it's free free it's there and it's you know i mean a lot of people are are pretty self-absorbed and self-serving and 
and they they just can't help themselves but i really believe that most people see through a lot of that it's kind of like when someone's just not genuine i think most people really sense it you know and you i just don't think it's in your best interest to not only overdo it which we've seen happen a lot where someone's just constantly touting themselves mm -hmm. but you know a lot of people that do that don't have a lot to back it up which is weird to me yeah and then you'll you know like someone like scott meter for example i mean i've never even seen him hardly post that he's even doing a gig you know right. like or what he played on, you know, like rarely, you know, it's like all of his is word of mouth and reputation. And it, it's just something that it's, it, we have to, we have to really self monitor ourselves, I think. And it's something that everybody needs to be more aware of, uh, especially in this game, because there's a million people doing it. You're just becoming part of the noise if you're, you know, not putting something out of substance like you said if there's a great video of you playing in a great situation mm -hmm. man put it up yeah let people see your thing you know but this constant every day went to guitar center and bought a cable just so you're visible on social media stop no substance stop you know yeah and and you know kind of the, what goes along with what you're saying is is you absolutely want to be tasteful with not only the amount of posts that you're making but with the content as well i mean you know there, there's something to be said about like you mentioned you know posting a great video of you playing in a situation where it sounds good looks good sure you, it's it's great to let to let people hear that you're proud of it and there's some substance there but you know not necessarily hiring a professional photographer to come in and take these photos of you standing on a ladder dropping drumsticks down on a camera lens. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, I got nothing. That's awesome. <laughs> but, but I mean, we know, you know, it, it, it's somebody like trying to, you know, kind of recreate some kind of a bizarre ad in a magazine right or something that that, that creates like intrigue on somebody it makes them feel more important than they really are that that's what bugs people man yeah it, it really does it's a, it's amazing man how i mean there there are websites out there that if you didn't know better you'd think you know someone is the scott meter of sure. atlanta even though they're not, you know, like just making it, hyping it and framing it as this, this thing that is, is kind of semi true at best, you know? And I, I think, I, I just encourage everybody to be real honest about stuff, you know, the, it, man, it's not, I don't know. I mean, in my, in my case, man, I've done a couple gigs that were okay, you know, pretty good, but, I, I don't talk about them much just because I don't really consider them that big of a success. Right. Be honest with yourself about it, you know? Well, you get into that thing of stretching the truth on a lot of, and I'll give you some examples of kind of what I'm talking about, about making things bigger than they actually are. You and I have both been in plenty of bands that have opened for like major headlining artists that everybody knows as soon as you drop the names like i've i've played in groups man that have opened up for earth wind and fire heart uh huey lewis and the news it just goes on and on and on and on and then all of a sudden you know on the resume it's like i have shared the stage with earth wind and fire i've shared the stage oh. with huey lewis and the news you know what i mean and and is that incorrect no, but I mean, is it really accurate also? Not particularly. And, and, and it's also the same thing. Let me tell you, I've played a lot of one-off style gigs 
with like jazz musicians that have come through town. When I lived in Memphis, man, I played some one-off gigs with with James Williams, R.I.P. Mulgrew Miller, R.I.P. Boy, I'm, I'm I, every gig I played with these guys, they're I killed them. You know, I played George Coleman. Um, this is uh, why you became a groove drummer. Exactly. Like, I, I can't keep can't keep up with that. I'm killing fellas. these guys. You know, but but you know, I, I'm really careful to say that I'm the drummer for Charles Davis, and he died recently also. Look at this. What's going on here? Because I did a couple of gigs with Charles Davis when he came in town here mm -hmm. in Atlanta, you know? And so, you know, just just be truthful, like John said. Just be truthful. with It's it's cool. Hey, man, dude, I wear it as a badge, man, that, that I got to play with. Of course, Mulgrew Miller. as you should. You know? But I don't go out and say that I was Mulgrew Miller's, you know, touring drummer no there, there's there's a there's a gray area where people will take advantage of that for sure i was like talking about share the stage uh, there's an ongoing joke with a few friends of ours where like i played the tabernacle for a corporate event on tuesday night and yeah. then you know wilco played on friday night their own show there and i'm like yeah. i shared the stage with wilco <laughs> <laughs> just happened to be the stage was 72 hours apart right. well for yeah. that matter i've shared the stage with the rolling stones and yeah you know, I mean, if you think about legendary venues i've gotten to play it's like give me a break man i've seen literally people hype like that like just so full of it it's like but that that shared the stage thing is lame yeah that's a, that's a weird i just unless it's documented there's pictures or video of you playing with that person leave that alone yeah that, that's just there's enough hype in this business without us adding to it absolutely totally agree and i mean we see it all the time all the time we see it it's not just drummers it's it's every every musician in every walk of life because we all it's just part of human nature that we want to be part of something bigger you know it's true yeah and i do i'm just not gonna lie about it you're a part of the drummers weekly groove cast hey off the disable list into the game i've shared the table with <laughs> phil smith <laughs> and you know when it comes to we've already talked about social media and it's really tempting, right, to get on there and post, post, post. Like you said, hey, I went to Guitar Center today and got a brick of sticks, right, blah, 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 whatever, that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you want to be real careful with that kind of stuff. However, let me say this. If you are going to post something that's meaningful, in other words, if you, if you want to post, like you said, a video, or like if we want to post something regarding this show, you know, to let people know that, that a new show is available, Something I think that's kind of cool and also important is when you post on multiple platforms, let's say like uh, Twitter or Facebook or Instagram or or even on like a, a forum, you know what I mean? Like an online, like a chat forum, something like that. Something that I think is kind of cool to do is don't post the exact same thing at the same time across multiple platforms oh, yeah. you, you know what i mean in other words if you've got a few different things like a few different ways to promote something a few different kinds of ads different pictures different text put it across different platforms and then switch them up you know what i mean i, th I think that's significantly more effective than maybe one of your followers you know having all of those all of these different social media outlets as well and then they see the exact same thing posted at the exact same time across instagram twitter facebook blah 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 mix it up a little bit you know it, it won't be it, it will it will not make the person watching it want to hide your posts right so you want to do that as well and then you know, one of the, the last things I wanted to say, and this seems very outdated, but I mean, it still works because there are, there are groups that I play in that you'll be playing and in the middle of a song or at the end of a song, or at the end of the set, somebody will come up and go, do you guys have a card? 
sounds completely and totally dated, doesn't it? In other words, because most of the time when we're making, especially personal connections, a lot of times it's like, hey, let me put you in, the, in my phone. And that's totally cool. But there are times when you're in a hurry, you can't all of a sudden go to somebody and go, my email address is blah, 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 blah. Can you remember that? And then you can email me. If you do have a card, you can hand it directly to them. Business transaction is done. At least you've kind of gotten that out. So I, I like to throw that out there too. That reminds me, I have to maybe get some cards and update my MySpace account. I've neglected it. Justin Timberlake and Vista Prince will be delighted. Phew. Justin Timberlake voted in Memphis the other day, by the way. Did he? Yeah, he sure did. Did it he made, put it all over social media? Promoted the crap out of it, and I immediately deleted it. That dumb. He's dumb. <laughs> That's dumb. Well, he, he invested in MySpace, so I think that'll tell you enough, oh. right? Yeah. Something tells me he's doing okay regardless of that Well, poor last, decision. The last time he called me, he said he was doing all right. Good, man. Yeah, it's good to hear, isn't it? I always get the inside dope from Phil. Yeah, well, you know. One more reason you should listen to us regularly. Get to know me. <laughs> John, you have anything you want to add on this stuff? You want to, anything you want to promote? Anything you want to plug? <laughs> um, well, there's two things. One is, uh, you know, a move can be really exciting. Yeah. I've, uh, I've done it both ways. I've done it sort of cold and I've done it, um, where I've had an established gig that made it really easy. But I think that the, the one thing you want to be careful of is if you do end up established and having a good gig and all that, it's probably in your best interest not to just rest on those laurels or just sort of disappear. Um, you know, I've been guilty of that on occasion, having a couple of really nice, comfortable gigs here in town yeah. where I just sort of fell off the face of the earth in a way, you know, moved further out of town and not being very visible and all that. And it's something you want to be careful of. And, and, um, yeah. And then to, to kind of continue on that, when you get kind of comfortable like that, like you said before, man, it is tough, tough, tough to convince yourself that you're going to drag yourself downtown yeah. to these different, you know, jams or different kinds of, of gigs at, and be out till one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm really a, I, I'm a bad example of how you can fold yourself into your couch and just sort of disappear. Um, and other than that, uh, I think the only other thing um, that I was going to say is, man, sometimes we overlook like a reliable vehicle. Oh yeah. Don't, you know, make sure you got that happening because that's such stress if you don't. So eliminate that stress if you're going to if you're going to relocate and I mean anywhere really even if you're not relocating. Right. A reliable vehicle is a good thing, but there's something you really want to have a good handle on. Man, a a good reliable vehicle is getting established and self-promoting all at the same time if you yeah, think about it. That's true, you know. Well, guys, we hope that that helped you out a little bit. You got a little bit of advice that, uh, you know, that'll help you further your career, help you do the right thing when it comes to both trying to get established and doing self-promotion the right way. So we want to finish off the show today with a segment. We haven't done this in a little while, but John and I thought it'd be good to, to bring it back. It's probably been at least two months, maybe even longer than that since we did this. We're going to talk about gear. There we go. Yes. So all you string players and trombone players and vocalists go ahead and turn off now because we're going to talk about drum gear really quickly bye-bye yeah we're gonna we're gonna talk about very important gear that we think it is to have but could be very underappreciated and and let me go ahead and say this both of these pieces that we're going to talk about today both my piece of gear and john's piece of gear cheap 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 but boy they they matter a lot John, you want to go first or you want me to go first? Sure. I'll go first. Um, my piece of gear that I love and would refuse to do without is a quick release hi-hat clutch. And I remember the day, Remo, 
introduced them. Mm -hmm. And my life got about eight to 10 threads easier. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, normally the, the old standard clutches yeah. had this, you had to screw on your, yep. the bottom piece. And Remo came up with one of these push and release quick things now. Um, and I've used the Remo one forever, but I know Gibraltar has a newer version mm -hmm. that looks even nicer and better. But we're talking about 25 bucks on average here for something that makes tear down and set up really easy. And it's just, uh, you know, they lock so they're yeah. not coming undone like a, a screwed version, uh, threaded version can. Right. I just love that. And man, a lot of people are aware of it, but some people aren't check that out man it's it's just gold i love that i love 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 it thank you remo belly r.i.p when you when you do fly out gigs and use other folks backline do you carry that sucker with you always there you go yeah. that 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 will speak volumes in itself yeah know? that that i i don't go anywhere without that yeah well now on to my el cheapo piece of gear i can out i can out cheapen you I Man, believe it on this one and my piece of gear that I like to have and I will actually keep some of these because I'm going to talk about it in two different ways I keep some of these in my stick bag which also would go with me on the road so we got that in common on this mm -hmm. something that I think is incredibly important for a few different reasons is I love the old floor tom isolation feet. Something that puts a little bit of air, a little bit of space between your drum and the floor. Because as anybody who knows who's been doing it for a little while, sometimes floor toms will just choke out because of the amount of contact they have with the floor. Sometimes it's also a combination between that and you can also have some weird things that happen with, with toms that act, or floor toms that actually might, the legs could rub up against the drum itself and cause some issues as well. And in as much isolation as you can get, you know, to keep that drum kind of suspended off the ground, it kind of creates a pseudo, I guess you might call it like a rims mount is what it does right yeah and it's the same theory yeah exactly and and the manufacturers of these feet that will go on different floor tom legs pearl makes isolation feet and then john you also told me that gibraltar is making they do uh, they have some that uh these as well yeah there's a little different than the pearl where pearl has that sort of hole. opened yeah. area hole mm -hmm. there gibraltar's they just basically drill from the yeah the bottom up and then so there's an air chamber there but they look a little more standard yeah and fit on some of the larger the thicker legs like too. the gretch like the gretch legs but yeah those are hard to yeah. dw and gretch both have that right and then if you want to go super budget from the standpoint of free something you can also do and this is what i actually carry in my stick bag you can actually cut out some little squares of I like to use kind of high density foam rubber, right, something thicker. that yeah, yeah, something Denser. that yeah that won't compress quite you know as as uh, as easily as as like the really uh, flimsy foam rubber porous yeah the porous stuff you can actually take those little squares and put them under your existing floor tom feet mm -hmm. and that does the job nicely as well the 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 biggest drag about that is if you do have to move your floor tom. Of course, those little squares are going to go a flying, uh, you know, whenever you, so you kind of have to reposition those, but I love them. I love them. Old school, old school, man. And that's, that's what I use. It's, that's part of my little must have gear. Our little tip and trick for the day, John. Love it. Well, we certainly enjoyed bringing you another week's worth of the groove cast. John and his infirmed state were, uh, we're going to go ahead and, and put some more medicine in his IV, get him back on the road to recovery. How you feeling over here, buddy? I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm doing okay. Thanks. <laughs> so that's going to do it for us this week. As usual, usual, we appreciate you listening to us. Feel free to reach out to us. As you can tell, we based a good part of, of today's shows uh, on, uh, on some advice and some questions that we got from one of our listeners. So email us, 
drummersweeklygroovecast at gmail.com. You can reach out to us on Facebook, Facebook facebook.com forward slash drummersweeklygroovecast, twitter.com forward slash dwgroovecast. There's our tasteful self-promotion to end the show. (coughs) Oh! (coughs) John needs a cigarette. All right. And we're gonna we're gonna let him light up, and we will see you guys next week. See you later. And freaks were in a circus tent. Ha! Those were the days. Those were-